Thank you so much, Shira, and thank you everybody for being here. I do uh, want to say one technical or administrative thing before we delve back into Shiftim. Um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody notes that in the, in the description of the course on the site, it states, or it should state, what dates the course takes place, because there will be a break during February when I'm going to be traveling for two weeks and wouldn't be able to teach. So this course is going to be eight meetings, but it's going to be a little bit more spread out. It's not going to be eight meetings one week after another. And then in um, March, it is going to be one date when it's Erev Purim. So it will actually Purim here in Israel. So uh, so I wouldn't be teaching on that day. So I just wanted to make sure it's, I see that Shira shared it in the chat. I just want to make sure that nobody goes through the effort of making time and arriving and then the class doesn't take place in the time you expected it. So I just wanted to put it out there. And on that note, let us delve um, straight back in here, unless there's something else you need to say. Well, I just wanted to add that you will receive reminders of this. So it is on the website on Rachel's program page. Um, I've just put it in the chat, but you will receive reminders you know, of that upcoming week to remind everybody when there is no class. So you don't have to remember it, you know, forever right now, but we wanted to make sure that everybody um, realizes that there will be a little bit of a stop and start. And as I said, we will continue to remind you as the weeks approach. Thank you, Shira. And without further ado, let us delve right back into where we stopped last week. Last week, we, we did really, in many ways, what I think is the most depressing stretch of the Book of Shoftim, not because it's the most horrific, there's many horrors for us to continue to explore in the coming weeks, um, but because it starts so optimistically. It starts with this moment when the people express their initiative and seem to take their fate into their own hands, and then they just fall apart. They don't cooperate with one another. Because of that, they don't successfully conquer the land. Because of that, they're tempted into idolatry by the people around them. And because of that, instead of upholding and thriving within the covenant with God, God abandons them repeatedly, allows other nations to take over them, and only um, promises to send judges to save them. But even the saving lacks some of the hopefulness that we usually associate with redemption because we're informed already from the get-go that it's going to be a cycle that continues on and on and on. The time and time again, there's going to be a moment of abandoning God. God will abandon us in turn. We will suffer under the subjugation of some other nation. We will call to God. God will send a judge. The judge will save us. There will be some sort of religious reform. And then after the, that lifetime of that judge, the whole cycle will begin again. And the question is, why should God even tell us that? What, why do we, reading the Tanakh millennia later, should care about these stories that repeat themselves time and time again, these stories of abandon, mutual abandonment, suffering, salvation, and so forth, if they don't take us anywhere? If at the end of the day, each of them is a story of a failed redemption on a deep sense, why do we care? Why was it important to document? And what I hope we will see as we go through these stories in our course is that while overall the trend of the era is, I would say, horizontal in the sense, or even going downhill in the sense that it's not taking us out of the cycle, every repetition holds within it moments of redemption, moments of inspiration, keys that can help us understand what is required in order to break the cycle and how we should understand the stories that follow, the stories of the rise of kingship and in what way they're truly offering something new, something that allows us to really break free from the shackles of this horrific status quo that we're exploring. And what we will see today in particular, but also throughout most of the stories we'll cover together, is that with every cycle, God is trying really hard to reveal himself, capital H. God is trying to pull the curtain and force the people, not just invite, force the people to notice who's pulling the strings of history. So in a sense, God is trying to correct the loss of memory 
that starts there, the loss of memory of God and everything he did for us to bring us into Israel and uh, out of Egypt, first out of Egypt and then into Israel. And it's almost as if God is a craftsman or a doctor that's seeing this amnesia, this selective amnesia, instead of just abandoning us to it and just saving us physically whenever we need, is doing his utmost best to make us see behind the curtain, remember who's behind history, who is the one we are covenanted to, and thus offer us the opportunity to strengthen our covenant and perhaps to redeem ourselves from the status quo. And in the story we're covering today, the story of the war of Torah, we will see God doing exactly that, trying to reveal his presence and his him as the moving power behind victory by granting us victory in a, in a way that's unexpected or that breaks expectations in several ways. But before we see how it's unexpected, let us look and see what the victory even is or what the situation even is. So we start um, by learning that um, the Canaanite nations which even though we conquered many of them still retained their strongholds in the Jizreel Valley in northern Israel. The Jizreel Valley is very important because it cuts across the mountain range that goes from south to north in Israel. It cuts across the mountain range from the area of the Sea of Galilee all the way to the Mediterranean and because of that it was a central road in the ancient times for anyone trying to get from Mesopotamia to Egypt, the big centers of civilization. So we hear that the Canaanites who held big cities, Megiddo, Tavets, in um, Jezreel Valley, cities that controlled the road and allowed them to control the Israelites who lived around there and forced them to pay heavy tributes to the Canaanites, um, are growing stronger and stronger. And God is sending us someone to relieve us from this unbearable and worsening burden. But the person God sends to save us is very unexpected because of her gender. Let us start here in Judges 4, verse 4. I'm going to read in the English. You have the Hebrew right in front of you as well. Deborah, wife of Lapidot, was a prophetess. She led Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Devorah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would come to her for decisions. In Hebrew, it says mishpat, which usually we translate in modern Hebrew, trials, judgment. Let us pause for a second, because I think that even just these three, these two, really, psukim, are already kind of outstanding. It's not the case, as we will see in other wars that we will visit in future uh, weeks of this course, it's not a case of a hero being called upon to lead people to war, even though there will be a moment like that soon enough. Instead, what we see here is a form of leadership that has some sort of regularity to it. It's not a war heroine rising out of nowhere to lead the people into victory. This is a woman who's described as used to sit, Yoshevet Tachat she's continuously sitting there. And clearly she has some sort of authority in the eyes of the people because otherwise they would not come to her for judgment. They would not come and bring their concerns to her. Furthermore, the very fact that she is sitting under a palm tree that's named after her means that she is so much of a feature, a regular feature of their life that even her environment is named after her at this point. So we see this woman, it's an unexpected role for a woman. We do not imagine women in this uh, position at this time in history. And in fact, it's also going to remain very unusual. We're not gonna see women like Tvora again for a long time. And now we will see that not only is she a regular authoritative, accepted normative leader of the people, but she involves herself in the, what I think many ancient people would call utterly unfeminine business 
of warfare. And this is what happens here in verse six. She summoned Barak, son of Avinon, of Kedesh in Naphtali. Like I said, there will be a summons for a hero. And said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, go, march up to Mount Tavor and take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zvulun. And I, and here she's speaking in God's voice, will draw Sisra, Yavin's army's commander. Yavin was the Canaanite king. Sisra was his general with his chariots and his troops towards you up to Wadi Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hands. Within these psukim, we note already a few more unexpected means of victory. First and foremost, like I already said, the fact that a woman holds the central position here. Not only is she a regular leader, she calls the shots, she is the one suggesting the strategy. She is the one appointing the high general of this war. And she speaks with great confidence and clearly with the expectation of being heard. This is not normal for the era at all. But this is only the first out of several unusual things. Also, the number of warriors is unexpected. You would think that for a war of this scale, when you're heading out to fight the big Canaanite cities that controlled the road from Egypt to Mesopotamia, that had what was the most advanced technology of the time, chariots that they used for fighting and gave them the advantage of speed and height in hand-to-hand -hand battle, you would think that you would do a general call for arms and you would bring as many warriors as possible. But that's not what Vora says. Vora says, take 10,000 men, and that's it. We will see later in the book that there's going to be much bigger armies involved in the wars to come. But here, it's really a very limited and clear number. Don't take as many people as you can. No, to achieve this victory, you take less people than you'd expect are necessary. Yet another opportunity for us, the readers, but more importantly for Vora's compatriots and contemporaries, to notice that something about this victory doesn't go according to the path of expectation of norm, that something about this victory doesn't make sense, thus inviting them to pull the curtain and see God's involvement face to face. But to these two unexpected means, I want to add another one, which is the way or the tactic Dvora offers. Because Dvora doesn't say, go and attack the Canaanite city or go and lay siege to the Canaanite city, which would be a normal thing to do when you're the one attacking. She says, go to Mount Tavor, which stands quite away from those cities. Those cities are more um, to the west. Mount Tavor is closer to the east, central east of the valley. Climb up. Mount Tavor is also unique because it stands alone. It's not part of a range. People say it looks like a pregnant belly in the middle of the valley. Climb up there and wait. This is a very odd way of starting a war where basically you're turning yourself into bait, but you have no guarantee that the people you're trying to bait will have any interest in pursuing you. They're just supposed to go climb there and wait. What if Yavin and Sister say, oh, fine, these 10,000, what can they do? We don't care about them. Then there's not going to be any battle and there can't be any victory. So to adopt this tactic is to say we're not fighting this war alone. We are trusting God to deliver on his promise and make our bait work. Make these people come to us. Now, it's not so clear here from the text. In order to say that, we would have to look at the song of Devora. We're not going to do it right now. We'll look at it later. The song that Devora sings after the war where she retells the details of the war. But another element or, that's unexpected in uh, God's, Devora's, soon to be Barak's battle plan is that the key, the thing that will clinch, clinch the deal and make the trap work is wholly dependent on the weather. Because what would happen, and here I'm giving you a spoiler alert, what would happen soon is that these 10,000 men with Barak will climb on Mount Tavor and wait and wait and wait. And you can just imagine them talking to each other, saying things like, what's going on? Is that actually going to happen? Etc. 
And then Sisra and Yavin, inspired by God to pursue them, will take the bait and Sisra will lead the warriors away from the shelter of this, the walls of the Canaanite cities and bring the chariots to surround, to attack around Mount Tavor. They can't bring the chariots up. They have to wait for those men to come down and fight them, but they know that they, the Canaanites, know that they have the advantage. And then a freak storm will happen, an unseasonable freak storm that will flood the rivers in the valley, turn the land and the roads into mud and incapacitate the chariots. And suddenly from a war where you have all the advantages over your ragtag enemies, you, in the sense of a Canaanite warrior, become a sitting duck. Is that an expression? Yes, a sitting duck facing these men who are unbound and undisturbed by the mud who just come and kill you, run from chariot to chariot and kill you, while you are still trying to find your bearing and fight a war in a way that's not used. So that's one more way in which God is trying to pull the curtain and prove to us, tell us that he is the one fighting this war and he is the one winning it. Now, in case we didn't get the memo, that this is an unusual war, not an expected normal war, but rather a God that is made possible or a victory that's made possible by God himself. Barak and Vora, once she tells him her strategy and orders him to follow through, have an exchange that once again emphasizes that this is not going to be a normal war. And here is this exchange. Just a moment, I'm going back to the same source. I'm reading from verse 8, Chet. But Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. If not, I will not go. Very well, I will go with you, she answered. However, um, there will be no glory for you in the course you are taking, for then the Lord will deliver Sisra into the hands of a woman. So Dvorah went with Barak to Kedesh. Kedesh is where he's mustering the army. And thus Dvorah trans transforms from a civil regular leader to a initiator of war to ultimately a participant, a co-general of war. You know, even today in our, in the 21st century, I think predominantly most leaders of armies are men. It's, and we are light years away from what the situation was in the ancient world. So here we see this very unusual woman taking this position. And furthermore, when she says to Barak, if, you, uh, if this is how we're doing it, Sisra will be given into the hands of a woman. I think that if we allow ourselves not to know what we know, or those of us who remember what comes next, it seems like a natural supposition that she means herself, that somehow Sisra is gonna fall in her hands. As we will see, that's not actually what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen instead is that the actual war is going to be decided by another woman and in a very, very unusual arena. The battle will take place at the foot of Har Tavor uh, once the rain comes and the river overflow and the chariots become incapacitated. But the thing, and we see that throughout Shoftim and Shmuel, the thing that gives victory its permanence is not beating a lot of people in a battle. It's killing the leaders. And the leader, Sisra, is not killed in battle. The leader ends up being killed in a very domestic arena by another woman who isn't even Jewish. So let's follow this leader and see how, uh, how things unfold for him and how this uh, victory takes place. First, let's see the moment of the battle in uh, Judges 4, 14. I'm still in the first box. Then on the day when God said, now is the time, Deborah said to Barak, up, this is the day on which the Lord will deliver Sisra into your hands. I think it's an ironic moment because it's not into your hands. The army of Sisra will be delivered into your hands, Barak, but not Sisra himself. The Lord is marching before you. 
Barak charged down on Tavor, followed by 10,000 men. And the Lord threw Sisra and all his chariots and army into a panic before the onslaught of Barak. Sisra leaped from his chariots and fled on foot. As Barak pursued the chariots and soldiers as far as Chawash Goim, all of Sisra's soldiers fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Even this detail subverts expectations because usually in wars, not everybody dies. Many people are stragglers and they spread around and make it, make it out. Here we have a moment where the entire army of Yavin, king, the Canaanite king, is eradicated. But what happens to Sisra? Let us meet, along with Sisra, a Gentile woman named Yael. I'm in the second box. Sisra, meanwhile, had fled on foot to the tent of Yael, wife of Hevel the Kenite, for there was friendship between King Yavin of Chatzor and the family of Hevel the Kenite. The Kenites were a people, an ethnic group, that we traditionally attribute uh, their descent to Itro, Moshe's father-in-law. Uh, and they migrated to the land of Canaan at some point around the time we did. And time and time again in the books of Shiftim and Shmuel, we see that despite the fact that they are not Israelites, we have some sort of uh, allyship or some sort of benev benevolent, positive relationship with them. But they are not ours. They're not our own people. And apparently they also were allies of Chatzol. So Sisra can be forgiven for assuming that if he goes there, he will find sanctuary from uh, the war that's killing all of his men as he runs. And Yael then goes and amplifies that impression. Yael came out to greet Sisra and said to him, come in, my Lord, come in here, do not be afraid. It's worth reading it in the Hebrew. Sua Adoni, Sua Elai, Al Tira. It's a very soft and inviting sort of beckoning. It's pointedly, we will see in a minute that this scene doesn't have any um, explicit sexual content. The encounter between Yael and Sisra at no point seems to uh, uh, become a sexual encounter but the language she uses, the behavior she uses has sexual implications. When she says, Sua Elai to me, it's a very intimate sort of expression. And then what she does is even more so. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I should say that in Hebrew, the word here is smicha, which in modern Hebrew we translate as blanket, but we don't know exactly what it meant at the time because it's the one single time this word appears in the entire Hebrew Bible. It's one of those things called milah yechidait, that there's only one of a kind. Because of the context here, we assume it means a blanket. 19, he said to her, please let me have some water. I am thirsty. She opened a skin of milk and gave him some to drink and she covered him again. Imagine the scene. He's there running, exhausted. He had to presumably drop his armor to be able to run fast. His man, he's, he's been hearing the screams of his man being slaughtered behind him. He is tired. And here comes this woman and says, come to me in this intimate language. And she takes him and covers him and offers him milk. More even than sexual undertones, what we see here are maternal undertones. Think about a mother nursing her child and tucking him in. Think how promising, how comforting this moment must have been for him. But he is still nervous, except he doesn't expect any danger from Yael. He expects danger from outside. As he says in verse 20, he said to her, stand at the entrance of the tent. If anybody comes and asks you if there is anybody here, say no. In other words, Yael is an intimate beckoner. She is a maternal 
giver of milk and tuck her in. And now she is a guardian. Again, a maternal image, I think, or parental at any rate, of watching over your child, making sure that they're safe. Then, Yael, wife of Hevel, took a tent pin and grasped the mallet. When he was fast asleep from exhaustion, she approached him stealthily and drove the pin through his temple till it went down to the ground. Thus, he died. Within this one verse, all the expectations Sisra clearly formed in this very domestic, warm scene are completely subverted. Any comfort or protection or safety he might have hoped for is snatched away. But the fascinating thing is that Yael doesn't merely use the domestic scene she is inhabiting here to achieve what Barak couldn't achieve a military victory for the Israelites. It's not just that she's uh, uh, using his expectations, using Sisera's expectation to lure him in and then killing him. She is also using tools that are domestic. She doesn't use a sword. She doesn't even use a knife. She's using the pin of the tent, the thing that literally holds her home, well, maybe not at this particular moment, but holds a home standing. She takes the tools of building homes and uses them to achieve this victory. In many ways, I think this is the climax of God's attempt in this particular war to make it very, very clear to us that it is his victory and not normal human victory. Because in a normal human victory, the arena of war and the arena of victory is out, outside, in the battlefield. It is predominantly male. Here, the arena is domestic and the tools of victory yielded by a non-Jewish woman. I can't highlight this enough. She's not a good from Jew. She's a foreigner. She's not part of our story. But the tools she's yielding are literally the tools that are used to build homes and hold them together. In many ways, I feel that this is a, a hint, a strong hint or a strong insight thrown to the Israelites, kind of a line that God is throwing to them. As I said before, God constantly throws hints and gives them keys to try and pull themselves out of the cycle they're stuck in. It's a key that says, if you want to fix what's broken with this era, with this time, if you want to break the cycle, the arena where you have to start fixing things is not out there. The arena is the home. The victory happens in the home and your metaphorical victory, your redemption has to start in the home, has to use the tools of the home, the relationship between people um, taking care of each other, all those things that we associate with domesticity and family life, that's where fixing things has to start. This course is about houses divided. It's about how families and shiftim in many ways are, are a stand in for the entire nation or the entire era. And here, this one home, this one family, that's in many ways not ours. It's not our story. It's not Jews. It's not part of our story in, in a significant way, but they stand in, this family and this home stand in to tell us that you can't fix on the macro level without fixing on the micro level. And also that the real problems of the era um, lie in the relationships and the familial relationships, whether it's between tribes who are each fighting their own wars, not helping each other, whether it's between generations when parents fail to pass on to their children, the stories of the past in a way that will inspire their children to uphold the covenant, whether it's in the fidelity between us and God, a fidelity that's often represented in the prophets um, through the symbolism of a marriage contact. Somehow the fact that Yael achieves this victory through the tools of domesticity brings to our mind or brings into the story undertones and allusions to all of those things that are hovering in the background of the era 
and drawing our attention to the fact that you can't fix the era without paying attention to this, to the home, to what makes homes stand and what can be their foundation. But there's more. Because when Yael kills Sisra, she does more than bring the victory into the arena of the house. She also, in many ways, represents to us or comes to represent to us what it takes to break the status quo. And I'd like to um, highlight two elements in Yael's actions that break the status quo. The first, is that she steps out. In verse 18, Yael came out to greet Sisra and said to him, come in, etc., etc." Mm -hmm. She is not passively waiting in the tent. Sisra doesn't burst into the tent and say, save me, thus dropping the potential of winning onto her lap. No, she goes out and seeks it. Yet another important message to a people dealing with a very difficult status quo. If you wanna break the status quo, you need to go out there. But there's more. By gaining victory, she becomes to represent the fact that the world of men, forgive me, uh, dear men listeners, uh, the world of men and its solutions falls short. That's not where the key to redemption lies at this moment. And the way the text tells us that, I'm, I'm not saying Yael thought all of these thoughts, but I'm saying the storyteller here thinks these thoughts. The way the storyteller tells us that is twofold. First, by creating a very interesting parallel between Sisra, the arch enemy, and Barak, the Israelite general. And let us see that. When we read the description of Sisra, right? I'm reading again verse 17. Sisra, meanwhile, had fled on foot to the tent of Yael, wife of Hever the Kenite, etc., etc. And Yael came out, Likrato, to greet him. Now see what happens after she kills Sisra. I'm in verse 22. Now Barak appeared in pursuit of Sisra. Yael went out to greet him and said, come, I will show you the man you are looking for. He went inside, of, inside with her and there Sisra was lying dead with a pin in his temple. Both men are chasing. Both men are chasing by foot. It's not mentioned here directly in Barak, it's mentioned in a different place that I'm not gonna bring right now in the limit of time we have, but and both of them come on foot, and both of them come in after Yael goes out likratam, towards them, and brings them into her trap, in the first case, or her confidence in the second. It's almost as if the text tells us, yes, one of these men is an enemy. One of these men is uh, the man we are supposed to boo as we read the story and one of these men is our hero or seeming hero the leader de facto of the war the man we're supposed to root for if we talk in modern parlance of storytelling to say yeah yeah keep chasing you win yet in terms of their interactions with Yael they are placed in the exact same position which hints to us that yes, one of them is the good guy and the bad guy in our scheme where we are the, you know, the center, it's our story and whoever is our enemy is the bad guy. But the world they inhabit is the same. The way they fight and win war is the same. They fight with weapons, they chase, they deal with problems by force. The solution doesn't lie in that world. The solution lies inside the house, as I already said, away from the expected path of warfare. Yet another way for God to hint to us very strongly that what we're seeing here is not a mere geopolitical phenomenon. What we're seeing here is an intervention that uses natural tools, warfare, people, warriors, a woman well-placed to carry out her role 
to achieve a not normal, not natural goal, God's goal. And in that regard, by not being either Barak or Sisra, and by having them described in parallel ways, Yael represents to us that to break the status quo of the era, we can't continue to pursue the solutions that are offered to us simply by force, simply by military success. Because military success is only a tool in the hands of God. And it is the recognition of who is behind the tool that will let us, lead us out of the era, not the tool itself. Forgive me. I mentioned before that the text highlights Yael's role in two ways. One is the way Barak and Sisra fulfill a similar role or, be, or are described in similar terms. But there's another different method that the biblical storyteller uses here to um, highlight Yael's model as a way to break the status quo of the era or as a way to win so to speak. And that is by supplying us with a mirror image, a negative mirror image of her, uh, a different woman who is her contrast in a very important way and therefore highlights what Yael does right. And we encounter this not in the text here, not in, the, not in chapter four, which describes in prose the war against Isra, but rather in chapter five, where Dvora, after the victory, sings a song and the people are listening. And in her song, she retells the story of the war and frames it for ge the generations ahead, before, uh, ahead, yeah. And in her poem, Dvora first describes um, Yael, and we're not gonna read it right now, but you have it here in the source sheet if you wanna see it later. And then immediately she describes another woman who does not go out of our tent, who is only inside, and who, as we will see now, represents um, Yael's negative, Yael's opposite. And this woman is Sisra's mother. And here is what Devorah has to say about this woman who until now had no part in events. There's no reason to assume that she played any geopolitical role. And yet in the poem, she is one of the final and most powerful images. Through the window, I'm in box three, verse 28. Through the window peered Sisra's mother. Behind the lattice, she whined. Note that she's behind the lattice through the window. She's not going out. She's not taking action. All she does is crying and whining indoors. She looks up, but she's not going to do anything about it. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why so late the clatter of his wheels? The truth is that this is a very heartbreaking image. Whatever you think of Sisra himself, well, however convinced we are that the war was necessary to break the yoke of Canaanite subjugation of the Israelites, the image of a mother worrying about her son and why he's late and why he didn't come home from battle yet, I think is a universal image. And it's a universal image that deserves compassion and acknowledgement. However, the development, what happens immediately after adds a darker nuance or a darker undertone to this very moving image. The wisest of our ladies give answer. She too replies to herself. Now we might think that they would say something along the lines of, don't worry, maybe because of the rain, the chariots took longer to come home. Don't worry, maybe, they're just delayed by some, you know, brawl amongst the men. No, here is the comfort that she herself and her wise women have to offer her as an excuse for why her son is running late. They must be dividing the spoil they have found. A damsel or two for each man. Spoil of dyed cloth for Sisra. Spoiled of embroidered cloth 
a couple of embroidered cloth round every neck as spoil. It should be said that in Hebrew, it doesn't say damsel or two, it says rechem rachamatayim, a womb or two. Sisra's mother and her speech, or at least her speech as Dvorah imagines it, this is not a, it's, we don't know if Sisra's mother really said any of these things. It's Dvorah's rhetorical device to teach us something. How does she comfort herself? She says, oh, of course, thirdly, because they must have won a glorious victory. And as they won a glorious victory, now they have spoils. And how does she describe the spoils of war? Not a woman, not which is bad enough that women are the spoils of war, a womb. She objectifies these spoils of war into, by describing them through the part of their body that's reproductive, and that's it. They're not even a damsel, they're a womb, a womb or two. Many commentators, by the way, think that this emphasis on fabric, on dyed cloth, um, is in reference to the clothes of the Israelite women. The, the clothes are taken from them to be given to the Canaanite women. So what she is imagining as a comforting image is women being taken as spoils and stripped of their clothes so that both their womb, their naked body and their clothes are given to the winners in separate form. Not exactly as inspiring of compassion and empathy, I'd say. But it's more than that. It's not just that it's an alienating reasoning or an alienating excitement for a woman to express when she discusses a subjugation of other women. It's not just that. It's also that even when Sisra is late, his mother cannot break free from the expectations that shape her world. In her world, he of the greater technological and manpower advantage is bound to win. And if her son is late, it's not because he lost. There's no way he had lost. No, it must mean that his victory was so great that it required greater dealing with details later. She cannot even imagine a situation where he lost. She sees the reality. The reality as she sees it is that the Canaanites have all the power and the Israelites don't. And she, not knowing that God is there working behind the scene, frames her expectations accordingly. She assumes that what was is what shall be. In that sense, the fact that she is standing inside the window gains a new significance. It's not just that she's looking out without going out. It's not just she's passive in her engagement with the world, an observer, but not an actor in it. It's also that she is framed. She is limited. The what she sees is limited by the windows of perception she has. She doesn't see the open possibilities out there. Everything she sees is framed for her by the life she lived until now, by the expectations she formed until now, by her reliance on force and might as the, deter as the arbiters of victory. If the Israelites had been similarly limited, if at the very beginning of this story, Devorah and Barak would have been convinced that there is absolutely no way for them to win because they don't have the power and they don't have the technology to win. Then when God had spoken to them, they would have rejected his words. They wouldn't have had the daring to carry it through. And if the Israelites themselves were limited by similar expectations, by the assumption that what you see is what you get, and you know the way wars are fought is the only way to fight wars, and if we don't have the advantage, we're going to lose, then even if Doran Barak would have mustered them, they wouldn't have come. They wouldn't have obeyed. They would have been scared to follow through. In other words, in order to achieve the victory, it wasn't enough for God to miraculously bring a storm. It wasn't enough for God to come up with a plan that emphasizes that he is the one pulling the strings and not us. We had to have faith in God and rise to the occasion. We had to believe that when God puts his finger on the scales, 
the expected outcome doesn't matter anymore. And we have a chance at winning. And as it was true for this particular battle, so it is true for the era in general. To break the status quo of judges, to break free from this horrific cycle of forgetting God, remembering God when we need him, forgetting God, remembering God when we need him, we need to be able to imagine, we, the ancient Israelites, I mean, need to be able to imagine that reality can change. If they become convinced by the cycle that what was is what shall be in some sort of an ecclesiastical way, like Kohelet says, you know, what was as shall be, the wind goes and blows and comes back, nothing is new under the sun. If they were convinced by that, then yes, they would not break free from that cycle. What we will see as we continue following the book is that despite that overall grim and depressing repetition at every generation, people do find it in themselves to believe that something can change. I wanna pause for a second. I still have an important uh, part of, the, of uh, this uh, war to discuss, but I, I'll, I'll take some of the questions here. Um, um, mm -mm. Uh, Gershon Hepner pointed out that Sisra's mother uses the same words uh, when, she, when she wonders about Sisra being late as the Israelites when they criticize Moshe for being boshesh, mm -hmm. a sexual word describing how Adam and Eve were not boshesh when naked. It's a, it's a really uh, fine observation. Thank you, uh, Gershon Hepner. Namely that the word boshesh has a sexual connotation and it's not just sexual, it's, it's shame. The connotation of shame, of being ashamed or unashamed of something. And it, which in M. Sisra's talk about wombs and clothes, the sexual connotation kind of comes to the fore. But it also reminds us that when people are worried that someone else is late, is a vulnerable time. When the Israelites worried that Moshe is late, that's when they went and built the golden calf. That's when they felt that they need a new security uh, valve in their life. They need a new thing to hold on to. But here, in a sense, it's, it's a nice variation because M. Sisra is not even looking for anything. She finds the security within herself just through her conviction uh, in what the future will bring. Just a minute. Um, Rebecca points out that the kind of irony, I, I'm rephrasing a little bit, the irony in M. Sisra's form of comforting herself is even more powerful because she focused on women as spoils and her son is taken down by a woman. That's very true. That we, the reader, know that as she thinks he's overpowering women, he was overpowered by a woman in turn. I would add to that that I think the fact that yeah, Elle's actions are have these maternal undertones and then we meet the actual mother also draws attention to the role of parents, to the role of family in perpetuating perceptions. And M. Sisra might have been a wonderful woman, we don't know, but she's part of a system that perpetuates a certain perception. And she doesn't break it, she doesn't step out, she doesn't go out of what frames her world, she just analyzes the world through this perception. If we wanna win, locally in this war, or generally by breaking through the status quo of history, we need to be able to be better than that, to do better than that. I'll see if we have time to look at more of the comments and questions later. I wanna continue now and point out that we spoke of three women today, Dvora, Yael, and the nameless anonymous mother of Sisra. Two of these women are clearly placed in domestic arenas, Yael, in her tent slash death trap, and Sisra inside her house looking out through a window. What about Dvora? Is Dvora homeless? Is Dvora a woman that doesn't exist in a domestic arena? Is she the Yotsemina Klala Meida Lakla, the one who, by breaking the rule, reaffirms the rule? No. Dvora, too, as a home, has a role inside a family. 
But to find this role, we need to look a little bit deeper into the text, to its hidden layers. In particular, in order to find it, we need to ask ourselves a different question. We need to ask ourselves, why is it that it is this victory that's celebrated through a song, while other victories, historically or later in the book of Judges, the victories we'll discuss next week and the week after that, et cetera, et cetera, are not celebrated by song. What was it about this victory that made it worthy of being sung upon? Why did Dvora choose to commemorate or clinch this memory in this way? Now, we can answer many ways. We can say, for example, that she's a prophetess. The other leaders who lead the people to war are not prophets. God interacts with them to call them into action, to call them to rise up and lead the people to victory, but they're not prophets, first and foremost. When we have a prophetess as a leader, it makes sense that she will then prophesy a poem, that she will then give it a narrative or a, a expression that goes beyond just the victory itself, because words that express God's deeds and God's messages are her trade. This is what she does. Another way to answer this question is that perhaps as a woman, Dvora is very aware that victories out there don't make an educational impact in the family, in the Jewish family, if you don't translate them into something that parents can share with their children and the children will grow up and share with their children, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, perhaps the fact that she turns the victory into a song step represents not the fact that she's a prophetess, but rather that as a woman, she is sensitive to the need to translate physical military facts into educational materials. Then the third answer I wanna offer and the one I wanna stick with right now uh, is offered by Dr. Rabbi Neria Klein who uh, writes about Dvora and the judges in general um, in the site of Haaretzion, Yeshivat Haaretzion. So Neria Klein says that yes, all the victories in the judges there are impressive in one way or another, but this victory, is more than that, because this is the last war we fight against the Canaanites themselves. There are many ethnic groups in Israel at this point, but the land is called the land of Canaan because the main ethnic group here were the Canaanites. They were the people God sent us to displace, to kill and displace and take over their land. And by finishing this war against the Canaanites and winning, even though there will still be wars against other ethnic groups in the future, as we will see many times over and over again. On some level, the people finally achieved the main goal they set out to achieve. On some level, this is the closing of the era of conquest. And if we understand that this is the closing of an era of conquest, if we understand that this is not just yet another victory, but the victory where our main enemy is eradicated, then it is very appropriate to sing a song because the first place where we acknowledge that this is going to be our mission was in a different song. In the song that we sang by the Red Sea, when we didn't only thank God for drowning the Egyptians, but we also alluded to the war that we will fight when we reach Israel. I'm here in box five. The people here, they tremble, the people as in the nations of Israel, Agony grips the dwellers in Philistia. Now are the clans of Edom dismayed. The tribes of Moab trembling grips them. All the dwellers of Canaan are aghast. Terror and dread descend upon them. Through the might of your arm, they are still as stone. Till your people cross over God, till your people cross whom you have ransomed. You will bring them and plant them in your own mountain, the place you make to dwell in God, the sanctuary, O my Lord, which your hand established. So it is only appropriate that this process that was first alluded to by the Israelites in one song is now its ending or its completion is celebrated in another. And there is another aspect in the song that I think supports this reading, which is the fact that Dvorah treats herself or calls herself a mother. I'm jumping ahead to box five. Um, 
to verse 7. Deliverance ceased, ceased in Israel, till you arose, O Devorah, arose, O mother in Israel. It is a very appropriate term to call herself if she has been the one to birth a new era, to take the people over the hump of conquest, which so far they were unable to complete, and brought it to a close and is allowing them, in a sense, to put the old mission behind them and turn on to new missions, it's very appropriate to describe herself as mother. She is birthing not one child, but she is burning a new era in our nation. And thus, Dvora too is put in the context of a home, which in Tanakh usually means a family, not just the physical house you live in, but a family, a dynasty. Her family is not just Lapidot, her husband, who by the way, many commentators say is not even her husband, it's a description of her profession. She used to make candles uh, for the Mishkan. Like they, they didn't know, the commentators didn't know what to make of the fact that she's introduced into the story as Eshet Lapidot, which usually would be translated wife of Lapidot, and then this Lapidot plays no role whatsoever. So this family, whatever family she has in her actual life, is, appears for a second and disappears. The family that she is central for is the people at large. And now I want to make one final point, and on that point we're going to wrap up today's class and, uh, and uh, leave it for now until we uh, see the next chapter in the cycle of uh, abandonment and redemption. Namely, I want to point out that if Vora is the mother of a new moment in our history, then it behooves us to ask what is she doing to help the people rise to this new point in history? If now they can close the Canaanite conquest and start building their life in Israel free from the Canaanite threat, what do they need in order to succeed in it? What kind of messages do they need? And the poem, the song that Vora offers them highlights two messages very, very strongly. One is the message we've been discussing this whole class, namely that the victory comes from God and that we're only successful when we work with God and obey God and follow the covenant. But if this would have been the only message, it could have easily encourage the people to behave with the same passivity as the mother of Sisra. Because if God calls the shot, we may as well kick back and let God save us. So what Dvorah puts at the center of her song, dedicating to it the longest bit of the, of the song, most words, and putting it at the very center of it, surrounding it by references to God's power, but really putting it at the center, is not God saving us is praise for those tribes that rose to fight God's war and criticism for those who didn't that come together to encourage the people not merely to see God behind the curtain and believe in them, but see themselves as powerful allies in God's war. Whether they succeed at seeing themselves as us or not, we will see next week on that note. Thank you all so very much for coming here. Um, and I um, unfortunately don't have time now to look at all the questions, but uh, um, you can email them to Torah and Motion and they'll forward them to me. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful, wonderful uh, rest of the week. Shira, back to you. Thank you so much for a wonderful Hello. Shira. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful. Very nice. Very Thank nice. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's lovely studying with you. Wonderful. As many times as I learned it, I always learn something new. I know what you mean, Rukhama. I feel the same way. Whenever, whenever I revisit Shoftim, it's, it's re, reopened for me. Yeah. So I, I understand. Nice. Goodbye, everybody. See you next week. Bye.